92% of households that join Peloton early in the year are still active a year later. Yeah, if you like cycling to EDM. Not just EDM. Try cycling to Broadway hits, take a scenic hike in Iceland on our treadmill, or row to some 80s jams. Because I have so much free time. Whether you have 30 minutes or just five, Peloton can fit any schedule. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton tread, row, or bikes risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Hello everyone, and thank you once again for listening to the saga of World War II, a Cassus Belly project. To start, we have a correction from Scott, who informed me that the USS Phoenix had 6-inch guns, not 8-inch guns. It was in fact a Brooklyn-class light cruiser, and thus had 15 6-inch guns. I'm not sure why I thought the Phoenix was a heavy, but thanks for the correction nonetheless. So in this episode, we're talking about China. We're nearly 50 episodes in, and I think I've spent a total of maybe 10 minutes talking about one of the largest theaters in the war in terms of both land area and people involved. The only real mention China has gotten was back in episodes 15 and 16, when I talked about Japan's rise in early war. The war in China was absolutely massive. It lasted 8 years, and 14 million Chinese died during the conflict with Japan. Not only that, but the Chinese played a material role not only in defeating Japan, but ensuring the survival of the Soviet Union to defeat Nazi Germany. For many in the West, the role China played in the war is often downplayed, or treated like an afterthought, when in reality, they were regarded as a major ally in the war, and Chiang Kai-shek was treated as something like an equal between Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. For some reason, in the post-war reckoning of the war, China's story faded, likely due to Cold War politics and the eventual triumph of Mao Zedong and the communists, who themselves wanted to downplay the nationalist achievements. At the time, however, China was given greater credit for its part, I think. Going back to the late 1930s, China's fight against Japan was considered a part of the global struggle against authoritarianism, spiritually linked to the Spanish Civil War and the fight against the Phalangists in Spain. Even on this show, I've given China short shrift, and my lack of knowledge concerning China was a known blind spot to me when I started the show. Well, I've worked on rectifying that in the past year or two, and here we are, the Big China Update. In the same way that we covered the European and Pacific theaters, I want to start incorporating China in the narrative. This will also include the China-India-Burma, or CIB theater, but I find when people talk about China-India-Burma, they tend to just focus on the Burma Road and Commonwealth forces in Burma. I intend for this to be much broader than that. What that means today is that I need to set the scene and get us caught up. I spent two episodes describing Japan's rise to imperial power in early war in China from their perspective. Now I want to do something similar for China, because frankly, China deserves it. Also, big shout out here to Rana Mitter in his book Forgotten Ally for completely overhauling my understanding of the Chinese theater of the war. Now, let's begin correcting that mistake with episode 48, The China Update, Part 1. I have been astonished that Japan should in a single day have plunged into war against the United States and the British Empire. What kind of a people do they think we are? Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget? By the early 20th century, China was a sad reflection of what it had once been. For millennia, the emperors of China had ruled the Han heartland and the coast of China, creating a veritable hemispheric hegemony. The emperors ruled by the mandate of heaven, pulling into their orbit the surrounding peoples in Japan, Korea, the interior steppe, and the jungles of Southeast Asia. Several times imperial dynasties had fallen, but were always replaced. Most recently the Ming dynasty had been usurped by the Qing in 1636, who were in fact not ethnic Han but Manchus, from modern-day northeast China. The Manchus quickly adopted Chinese practices and modes. Much as the title of Caesar persisted in Europe long after the fall of the Roman Empire, so too was the cultural weight of the Middle Kingdom that its conquerors adopted its language, practices, titles, and offices. 
The Qing state, run by its Manchu officials, blossomed in the early modern period. A rational system of competitive examinations provided a route for intelligent but low-born men to enter into officialdom and fostered a merit-based system. The arrival of foreign traders in the mid-17th century spurred a period of massive economic growth in China, much as it did in the rest of the world. In the first period of globalization, massive silver galleons plied their trade across the Pacific, bringing not only wealth, but new crops. New world foodstuffs, especially maize, allowed Chinese peasants to cultivate new lands. In a land where rice dominated in the south and cereal grains dominated the north, corn made the drier, more rugged inland arable. In the century from 1700 to 1800, the population of China exploded from 150 million to 300 million. That is nearly the population of the United States today. And the goods didn't just flow one way. Chinese ceramics, simply called China, became luxury items demanded at every court in Europe. If you're interested in this period, I can't recommend Charles Mann's book 1493, his sequel to 1491, enough. I've read both books twice, and they provide a fascinating look at pre-Columbian Americas in 1491, and then, in 1493, how the world changed after the discovery of the New World. China was a supremely self-confident civilization, believing itself, like nearly every civilization, to be the greatest in the world and the center of the universe. Unlike the Japanese, who turned inward, however, China remained open, though still aloof and somewhat uninterested in the rest of the world. Over time, the Chinese state would atrophy. The exams became less a test of critical skills, but more a set of antique trivia one had to memorize to enter into the halls of power. The Manchu government, while having adopted many Chinese practices, retained many traditional Manchu forms at court remained a small insular bureaucracy that could not efficiently govern the now massively expanded economy and population. This, combined with extreme inflation from the amount of Spanish silver pouring into the country, weakened the state's monetary faculties. Just as in Europe, where new world wealth caused massive inflation and instability, so too did it in China. The arrival of Westerners en masse in the 19th century and the commodification of opium would prove catastrophic for an already weakened Chinese state. The 19th century is often referred to as the century of humiliation in China, and for good reason. Between roughly 1800 and 1900, China was repeatedly subjugated, pilfered, and exploited by Western powers, reducing it from a mighty hegemonic major power to a broken husk of a state. It was not simply outside forces that caused China's fall from power, however. Internal divisions, exacerbated by the aforementioned problems with Manchu government, would bring the country down from within. Two massive revolts rocked the country during this century, one being perhaps the largest civil war ever. It's hard to say what was the first mover in beginning the 19th century fall, but opium is as good a place to start as any. For centuries, opium had been a luxury enjoyed by the elites and wealthy, but after the arrival of the British, the opium trade grew immensely. British traders who came seeking tea to export back to the West found that if opium could be commoditized and sold in bulk at cheap prices, there was much profit to be made. So the tea traders wound up doing just that, selling opium in bulk to the masses. The Mandarins and Manchus recognized opium for the public nuisance that it was, and in 1839 raided the British-owned factories in the port of Guangzhou, also known as Canton. When word got back to London that the Chinese had treated British subjects so harshly and violently, Lord Palmerston, the foreign secretary, was enraged and authorized a punitive expedition to teach the Chinese a lesson. Thus, the first opium war started. The gunboats of the Royal Navy made quick work of the Chinese defenses in Guangzhou, then followed up with campaigns up the Pearl and Yangtze rivers. What resulted was the first of what came to be known as the Unequal Treaties, with the Treaty of Nanking. The treaty made the Chinese cede Hong Kong to the British, forced them to open their ports to Western traders. Over the next several decades, similar events would force the Qing government to surrender yet more territory and rights. Cities like Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Macau all ended up under foreign control, whether that be directly under a foreign ruler or by a city concession composed of Western expats. Perhaps the greatest humiliation, however, was the practice of extraterritoriality. Under extraterritorial law, foreigners were not subject to Chinese laws, no matter where they were in the country. Any breach of the law by a foreigner under extraterritorial protection would not face justice in a Chinese court, but rather in what were called mixed courts, which were run by Westerners with Western interests in mind. This blatant disregard for Chinese sovereignty was a great affront to their dignity and a national embarrassment. Shanghai was one such concession city. Before 1842, 
It was a small trading city on the shores of the Huangpo River, near the mouth of the Yangtze. But after being opened up to foreign traders in the Treaty of Nanking, it became a major trade hub. It was governed by three different bodies. Within the French concession, essentially a French colony within the city, a council of Frenchmen elected by French colonists ruled. There was another concession, however, the International Concession, which was not really a colony of any particular country, but instead a sort of independent city governed by elected foreigners, mostly British, but there were also many Americans and Japanese. Elsewhere in the city, the Manchu government had nominal control, but in the confusion, organized crime thrived. Prostitution, gambling, and racketeering ran wild, but so too did commerce. Shanghai became an entrepot, where rising Chinese intellectuals could go to get a taste of the West and mingle with people of all backgrounds. Along with traders seeking fortunes, there also came missionaries, seeking to convert China to Christianity. The mostly Protestant missionaries did have some success, to the chagrin of the imperial government. One such convert was a man by the name of Hong Zhiquan. A man of humble origins from Guangdong province, Hong Zhiquan suffered a mental breakdown after repeatedly failing the imperial examinations in the 1850s, and so created a sect of militant pseudo-Christianity bent on creating God's kingdom in China. I say pseudo-Christianity because one of the founding tenets of the Taipings was that Hong was the younger brother of Jesus Christ and that Hong would regularly commune with his older brother and father in heaven. Generally called the Taipings, the men who followed Hong sought to establish the Taiping Tianguo, or Kingdom of Heavenly Peace. What followed was the largest civil war in all of history, and likely the second most deadly war of all time, following the Second World War. The Taiping Rebellion began in 1850, with a revolt in Guangxi, and lasted 14 years, during which as many as 30 million people died, roughly 10% of China's population. China in 1850 was ripe for rebellion, and the Taipings provided a standard around which the pent-up rage of the population could muster. The Taiping armies fought effectively, their organization, motivation, and discipline far outstripping those of the imperial banners. By 1853, the rebellion had spread far and wide, controlling a third of the country, including Nanking, while threatening Beijing itself. For all of their military success, the Taipings were terrible administrators. Their zeal for their profit and commitment to their religion's strict morality made the rule oppressive and arbitrary, even compared to the oppressive and arbitrary Manchus. They also failed to get buy-in from the middle or upper classes, or much foreign support. After a few years, infighting began to plague the Taiping generalship, especially once Hong began to withdraw into himself, spending his time in mystical meditative seclusion, alone with his women. The Taipings also failed to ever secure a coastal port, denying them access to the outside world. By the 1860s, the Taiping was in rapid decline, and imperial armies were conquering Taiping forts one by one with the help of western-trained armies. In April 1864, Hong died from eating poisonous weeds, and in June, Nanking fell. A hundred thousand people are reported to have died in the battle in its aftermath. Hong's chief lieutenants, or Wangs, were executed, and the greatest civil war in all of history was over. China was devastated. Millions of people were dead, dozens of towns and cities burned to the ground, and whole provinces laid waste. The Taiping were defeated, but the Qing government had to make compromises to do it. One was the creation of new armies. These new armies were not controlled by the central government in Beijing, but rather by local officials, who were allowed to raise their own armies to defeat the Taipings. This decentralizing of the military gave rise to powerful warlords, who would not simply relinquish their own power once the Taipings were dead. This weakened and fractured state would make China even more vulnerable to abuse from the outside world. The now even weaker and more insular government in Beijing had less influence on the state of the homeland than ever before. Lawlessness and brigands became more common. Foreigners could run roughshod over any Chinese, and abuse by foreigners became commonplace. The Sino-Japanese War of 1894 served to further humiliate and weaken China, further demonstrating the ineptitude of the regime. While China was crumbling, Japan was modernizing and strengthening, as we discussed back in episode 15. By the 1890s, Japan was nurturing a small empire and seeking further lands, resources, and peoples to exploit. Now, I don't want to get into the intricacies of Sino-Japanese-Korean relations in the late 19th century because it's complex and I'm not really qualified to speak on it, but suffice it to say that for centuries Korea had been within the Chinese sphere of influence and something of a vassal or satellite state. As Japan's power grew, she wished to seize the Korean peninsula and add it to her growing domain. The First Sino-Japanese War resulted in a crushing Chinese defeat. 
Japanese troops trounced the Chinese soldiers, demonstrating what few military reforms the Qing government had undertaken were ineffective at best. At the Treaty of Shimonoseki, the Chinese were forced to turn Korea over to the Japanese, who eventually annexed it in 1910, as well as Taiwan. Japan had now, without a doubt, secured its position as the geopolitical center of mass in the East. Five years following the humiliation of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, tensions built up and resentment towards foreigners festered until the eruption of the Boxer Rebellion in 1900. The rebellion was a peasant uprising, the rebels' affinity for martial arts, often called Chinese boxing at the time, lending to its name. And the name really wasn't far off. The secret society that initiated the rebellion called itself the Yihuquan, or Society of Harmonious Fists. Antipathy to Westerners, crushing poverty, and a vicious drought came together that year to push the peasants over the edge. The rebels exacted their vengeance on any Westerner they found, and on Chinese Christians. As the rebels picked up momentum, they laid siege to foreign legations in Beijing and Tianjin. Unwilling to wait for the ineffective Qing government to put down the rebellion, the great powers formed the Eight Nation Alliance to quell the boxers. Consisting of the United States, Austria-Hungary, the British Empire, France, Germany, Italy, and Russia, each nation sent troops to put down the rebels, the total strength of which reached 20,000. The United States had a large formation nearby in the Philippines already, who had recent experience in crushing rebellions and fighting the Philippine insurrection. The boxers were put down, and the entire province around Beijing was occupied by foreign armies, and Manchuria was occupied by Russia, during which time the armies looted and ravaged the landscape. The resulting treaty forced massive indemnities on China, and resulted in the permanent loss of Manchuria. Once again, China was humiliated and occupied, her sovereignty trampled. After successive defeats and humiliations, even the backward-looking and insular imperial court in Beijing had to acknowledge that something needed to change. In 1902, the Qing began a series of reforms meant to transform the country into a constitutional monarchy on the model of Japan. These reforms included the creation of representative bodies, which at first were organized at the local level, but were to eventually include a national assembly of some sort. These Jinxiang, or new government reforms, were too little, too late, however. There were simply too many vested interests that did not consider their survival of the regime to be in their own interest. The regional military powers were reluctant to surrender their broad powers to a strong central government or newly appointed bureaucrats or a professional officer corps. The middle class was ostracized when, in 1905, the government exams were reformed. The old parochial test was updated to better reflect what was needed in a modern bureaucracy by testing for things like foreign language skills, science, and math instead of ancient Confucian philosophy. The aristocrats and bourgeoisie had spent their lives studying for the old test, however spending small fortunes preparing and felt disenfranchised when their life's work was seemingly made meaningless overnight. By the early 20th century, the population demanded more than modest and gradual reforms. Revolution was on the people's minds. It was in this environment that Sun Yat-sen, the grandfather of Chinese liberalism and godfather of the Kuomintang, entered the historical stage. A doctor and a Christian from Guangzhou, Sun Yat-sen spent the last decade of the 19th century fomenting revolution moving about secret societies and revolutionary circles, even leading his own secret fraternal organization. For his work, the Qing put a bounty on him, so he fled to Japan, now the center of learning and enlightenment in the East. Revolutionary fervor boiled over in the fall of 1911. The Wuhan garrison had become infiltrated by revolutionaries, who had been caught in a bomb-making plot. When the authorities came to arrest the soldiers, they staged a countermarch to the military headquarters and presented an ultimatum to their commander, join the revolution or die. Their commander, knowing which way the wind was blowing, committed his whole garrison to the revolution and declared Wuhan independent of the Qing regime. As news of the revolution in Wuhan spread, so did the revolution itself. Other cities and revolutionary cliques copied Wuhan's example and declared their own independence. The newly created provincial assemblies joined in the revolutionary spirit as well, and declared themselves part of the new Chinese Republic, and appointed Sun Yat-sen as its first president. The old regime proved fragile, and all it took was a gentle shove to topple it. That is not to say there was no fighting. There were some skirmishes between revolutionaries and imperial troops, but the whole thing was a relatively bloodless affair when compared to something like the Taiping Rebellion. In early 1912, the writing was on the wall, so Yuan Shikai, commander of the largest imperial army in China, proposed an end to the fighting. He offered the abdication of the six-year-old Puyi emperor if the revolutionaries would allow the boy and his household to live out their days with a pension and estate. 
the revolutionaries agreed, and thus, on February 12th, the last emperor of China abdicated. China was a republic. China's experiment with liberal government would not last long. Despite selecting Sun Yat-sen as the first president, real power still lay in the old hands of militarists. Yuan Shikai, in particular, remained an influential figure, and in less than a year, he had deposed Sun. This did not stop Sun completely, however. He still ran in the parliamentary elections held in late 1912, when his nationalist Guomindang Kuomintang party won the majority of seats. Things took yet another turn for the worse in March 1913, when the Guomindang candidate for prime minister, Song Jiaren, was assassinated, likely by Yuan. In the turmoil that followed, Yuan dissolved parliament and Sun fled the country for Japan. Yuan remained in power until he died in 1916, but he negotiated away many of China's rights and status to Japan at the time. With the West distracted by the First World War, Japan took advantage of the power vacuum to exact tribute from China, including forcing China to accept Japanese military attaches, extortionary trading rights, and territorial concessions. After his death, the country descended into warlordism. Generally, the government in Beijing was considered the recognized legitimate power in the country, but this was mostly a polite fiction. Following the end of the war in Europe, the German-held territories needed to be divided up. China had hoped to have the German-held cities return to the Beijing government. China had cooperated with the Entente, even sending 100,000 laborers to Europe to assist with the war effort. When the Versailles Treaty granted Germany's former colonial possessions in China to Japan, the Chinese were once again furious and humiliated. News of the West's betrayal led to massive student protests in Beijing. On May 4, 1919, 3,000 students marched to the foreign legation and to the house of the ministers they deemed responsible for the humiliating treaty. They demanded a rational government, modern, liberal government, and their march grew into what became known as the May the 4th Movement. At the same time that something like Western liberalism was finding a home in the Guomindang, the Chinese Communist Party was coalescing. The first Chinese Communist Party Congress was held in 1921, and the triumph of the 1917 revolution in Russia gave Chinese communists hope that, perhaps, they too could transform their country. The CCP was a fledgling party, however, and hardly had a base of support in the early 1920s. After the death of Yuan, the Guomindang found a base of support in Guangzhou, where the warlord Chen Jiangming provided protection for the nationalists, allowing the party to organize. For years, Sun Yat-sen had been seeking foreign aid to raise the profile of the Guomindang and to help unify China under the nationalist rule. Generally, he met with little success. The West was either uninterested or preoccupied, despite Sun spending years campaigning and fundraising in Europe and the United States. His big break came in 1923, when the newly formed Soviet Union agreed to an alliance with the Guomindang. In a show of commitment, Sun dispatched a delegation to the Soviet Union, including the up-and-coming Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang had been born to a merchant family in Ningbo, a city on the Yangtze Delta in 1887. His middle-class upbringing had provided him with a traditional Confucian education. He aspired to a military career from his youth, believing that China must be united and cast off the yoke of foreign imperialism. He first attended a military academy in North China before leaving for Japan in 1907 to attend the Tokyo Shinbugaku, a military school run by the Japanese Imperial Army for Chinese students. After graduating, he spent three years in the Japanese Army until 1911. Chang's time in Japan not only provided him with a military education, but a revolutionary one. Many aspiring young Chinese went to Japan to learn modern sciences and thought, including military science. Chang was ever an enigma to both his friends and colleagues, not to mention enemies. Few knew him well, but he was certainly a sharp political player and military thinker. But one vice he could never be accused of is indecision. Japan in the early 20th century was a veritable hotbed of revolution and Chinese revolutionaries, and it provided Chang with the knowledge and connections he needed to be set up for success when he returned to China in 1911. For his role in the Xinhai Revolution and his up-and-coming status in the party, he was selected for the delegation to the Soviet Union. Chang's star was clearly rising and his political fortunes growing, but his time in the Soviet Union did nothing to improve his opinion of communism. He found the Soviets conceited and autocratic, which seems a reasonable conclusion based on what 1920s Moscow was like. Lenin's Bolsheviks were consolidating power and instituting draconian measures to do so, while constantly lecturing about workers' rights. He came away from his experience with a lifelong revulsion to communists. 
For the actual Chinese Communist Party, the alliance with the Soviet Union was something of a double-edged sword. The Soviet Union was not only home to the most successful Communist Party in the world, but also the Communist International, or simply Comintern, the worldwide governing body for all Communist parties, meaning the CCP basically had to take orders from them. The Comintern more or less ordered the CCP to enter into union with the Nationalists, forming the United Front. While this gave the Communists ample room and opportunity for recruitment and expansion, it also essentially melded the two parties together. The Nationalists and the Communists worked together from 1923 to 1927, during which time influential men in both parties honed their skills. Zhu Enlai, later to be Mao's premier, served in the political education department under Wang Jingwei, a giant in his own right in the Guomindang. Chiang Kai-shek would be named commander of the National Revolutionary Army in 1926, and Mao Zedong would become the director of party propaganda in 1925. Mao was about as different from Chiang as one could get personally. Where Chiang was quiet, harsh, and distant, Mao was gregarious and outgoing. Born in 1893 in Hunan province to a wealthy peasant family, Mao did not get along with his conservative traditional father, so left home early to take up political journalism. Like Chiang, he yearned for a free and united China, but unlike Chiang, he thought a total transformation of society was necessary to pull China out of the past and into the future. When the Xinhai Revolution broke out, Mao joined a group of armed revolutionaries in his home province and began his own revolutionary journey. In 1925, the whole of China seemed once again primed for mass civil unrest. In May, workers in Shanghai protested mass layoffs in one of the city's major factories. The police, administered by the British but with Sikh patrolmen, quashed the labor protests, but killed 11 protesters in the process. News of the event spread like wildfire, resulting in yet more protests and marches across the country. Then in June, another massacre occurred, in which foreign troops killed 52 people, including school children. The situation may well have been exactly what Sun Yat-sen needed to garner nationwide support and establish the Guomindang as the national government, except he had died of cancer in March, so there's no clear leadership for the party. In June of that year, Wang Jingwei was named head of the political council and essentially head of the party. For the next year, the party and country existed in an uncomfortable state of flux. In June of 1926, Chiang was appointed the head of the National Revolutionary Army, the party's military apparatus. He led the army as it conquered and coerced city after city to acquiesce to the Guomindang. Many feared the arrival of Chiang's army, believing it to be communist aligned, since the Guomindang was allied with the Soviet Union and contained communists. The army's greatest victory came in 1927 when it captured Shanghai. This not only cemented the Guomindang's power in the country, but also Chiang's place within it, essentially allowing him to eclipse Wang Jingwei, widely considered Sun Yat-sen's protege and successor. The capture of Shanghai also demonstrated just how far off the mark many of the people's suspicions of the Guomindang's communist credentials were. The CCP had deep roots in Shanghai, and Chiang feared their influence as a rival faction within the nationalist government, so he had them eliminated. Before even entering the city, Chiang had all of the communists identified, so that upon his arrival he could have them rounded up and executed. Thousands were killed and murdered, many of whom were likely innocent. With the nationalists' sudden betrayal of the communists, the CCP fell out of alliance with the Guomindang. The communists, including Mao and Zhu Enlai, fled Guangzhou for the interior of the country, to go into hiding and begin rebuilding the party away from the nationalist centers of power. With the communists now out of the picture, and with the backing of the army, Chiang had effectively ousted Wang Jingwei. Wang attempted to form a rival government, but without the backing of the communists or the army, he had no real hope for success. Out of power, he receded into the political wilderness. In 1928, Chiang capitalized on his success and established a nationwide government in Nanking that would be recognized outside China. In reality, the country remained divided. The nationalist government controlled the coastal provinces around Nanking, but the further from Nanking one traveled, the more tenuous that hold became, many areas remaining autonomous or only nominally under the control of the central government. Chiang and the nationalists would undertake a massive program of modernization and industrialization throughout the 1930s, however. The railway system was expanded, and the total distance of paved roads would double during the decade up to 1937. The establishment of an actual legitimate government in China, as opposed to the personal kleptocratic fiefdom of an opium-addicted warlord, was quite alarming to the Japanese. Playing strongmen off against each other and leveraging legation coastal cities had proved to be an effective strategy for the Empire of Japan. Having someone like Chang in power and quickly consolidating more of it 
threaten their ability to wantonly exploit the mainland. The two governments would soon begin to clash. The first row came in September of 1931, when the Kwangtung army orchestrated the Manchurian incident. They claimed that the local population had grown disenchanted and thrown off the yoke of the warlord government of Zhang Julang. In its place, the Kwangtung army formed a sort of satellite state of Japan called Manchukuo. There was little enthusiasm in China to resist Japanese encroachments, however. Manchuria was not considered part of the territorial core of the country, and the mostly Han Chinese population did not wish to spill blood to retain it. So the nationalist government did little more than lodge protests with the League of Nations. The loss of Manchuria was nonetheless a massive blow to Chang's power and influence. Chang needed to prove that he was China's indispensable man, so did the only thing he could to prove it. He resigned. Following his resignation, a short period of political chaos ensued. There were protests in the streets demanding Chang's return, the military refused to accept the authority of a new head of government, and local governments would not transfer tax revenue to the central government in Nanking. Chang's gamble had paid off, and he was quickly restored to government, bringing his rival Wang Jingwei in under him. After returning to power, Chang was again faced with a national crisis in 1932, when street fights broke out in Shanghai between Chinese laborers and Japanese monks. The Japanese naval garrison commander saw this as an opportunity to gain prestige for the navy, which was feeling emasculated after the Japanese army's success in Manchuria, yet emboldened by the Chinese lack of response to that conquest. He unleashed his forces on the Chinese population, prompting Chang to send the Chinese 18th Route Army to fight back. A small war had broken out between the two countries in the city, with trench lines and soldiers lining streets and alleyways. The fighting only lasted three weeks, but it was savage. Thousands of Chinese and Japanese soldiers died, along with roughly 10,000 civilian inhabitants of the city. Chang knew his country could not fight a general protracted war with the Japanese, so he agreed to terms. They were characteristically embarrassing and humiliating for China, essentially removing the Nanking government's right in Shanghai. Adding insult to injury, the Communist Party declared that they would have never folded to Japanese demands so easily, and would resist them at all costs. This caused Chang to be even more bitter towards the Communists, and to see them as yet another dividing factor in the country. Despite his growing reputation as an appeaser, Chang was in fact desperately trying to prepare for war with Japan. His primary goal was to at least create a small professional army within the larger National Revolutionary Army, which was more of a loose association of militias than an actual unified fighting force. To do this, he brought in German advisors. First, Hans von Siecht, who was followed by Alexander von Falkenhausen. Their job was to drill the army in German methods and create a professional corps capable of taking on the Japanese army. Roughly 80,000 men would go through the German-style training regime. A decent number, but only a fraction of the millions of men that would be put under arms in China. While attempting to arm China and unify the country against what was an inevitable confrontation with Japan, Chang remained ever challenged by internal disputes and dissent, especially with the communists. The CCP was weak in the early 1930s, however. In wake of Chang's 1927 purge, they had fled to Jiangxi province, where they formed a sort of semi-independent government where they could experiment with communist ideas. The communists proved to be at least as dangerous to themselves as the nationalists were. The radical reforms they implemented were deeply unpopular, and the population and factional infighting became increasingly problematic. At the same time, after the truce with Japan in Shanghai, the nationalists were able to redirect their forces to fighting the communists once again. Unpopular, under siege, and constantly engaged in internecine bickering, the CCP had to make a bold change. What resulted was the Long March. Since mythologized in the annals of CCP history as a formative moment for the party that forged its leaders into heroes and legends, the Long March was in all reality a humiliating retreat. In June 1934, the party and all of its loyal adherents packed up and began walking northwest in search of a new home. 80,000 men, women, and children marched into the proverbial desert. When the march came to an end nearly 18 months later in Shaanxi province, only 7,000 remained. The Long March was formative in two key ways, however. Mao emerged as the undisputed leader of the Chinese Communist Party, and the party had reached the nest from which it would build itself up into the CCP that would conquer the whole country. Just before the communists had reached their mountain strongholds in Shaanxi, the political landscape had shifted beneath them once again. With the rising threat of fascism in Europe, the Soviet Union and the Comintern had declared a global struggle against fascism, 
This meant that the CCP was to follow orders and cease fighting against the Guomindang, and once again enter into coalition with them. It may seem odd that the Soviet Union would force another communist party into a subservient position with a non-communist party, but the fact was Stalin was terrified of an even weaker China. If China fell or collapsed, he would no longer have a buffer between his eastern flank and Japan. As long as China remained at least minimally functional, he could rely on them to be a faithful ally of convenience against the Japanese. He understood that Chang was all that held China together and did not want the CCP to destroy a solid geopolitical fellow traveler. Once the CCP had settled, they began to enter into talks with the Guomindang to figure out exactly what their arrangement would be. Chang acted fairly aloof toward the communists, feeling they had been thoroughly routed and not worth his time, but agreed to negotiate regardless. Shortly after they had come to terms, in December 1936, Chang went to expect troops in Xi'an. There, something completely unpredictable happened. Chang was abducted. Zhang Juleng, the deposed warlord from Manchuria, had ordered his troops to surround Chang's villa and hold him hostage. Chang was not a communist sympathizer, or making a bid for his own power, however. He was instead what could only probably best be described as a Chinese ultranationalist. He was angry with Chiang Kai-shek for continuing the fight against the communists when the true enemy, the Japanese, were ever growing. Little did he know that Chiang had just concluded an agreement with the CCP to end partisan fighting. For two weeks, Chiang was held in confinement, and the whole of China held its breath. Zhang Juleng, meanwhile, became more and more unpopular, while pressure mounted to launch a raid to get Chiang Kai-shek back. His wife, Song Mei Ling, ever his muse and often his mouthpiece, cautioned against this, however, and negotiated his release. Zhang Juleng was taken into custody and held under house arrest until 1990. The detente between the Guomindang came just in time. The United Front would fight as one against the Japanese, at least in name, and their armed forces would fight together. There were still semi-independent warlords throughout the country, especially in the border area between Beijing and Manchuria. Though nominally under nationalist control, these areas were really more the personal domains of the local generals, who all had understandings with the Japanese. This inherently unstable situation would lead to a skirmish at a small village called Wangping, in July 1937 between the Chinese 29th Army and the Japanese North Garrison Army. History remembers this event as the Marco Polo Bridge incident. Though the two countries were not yet locked into the years-long struggle that would follow, all of the conditions had been met for this border skirmish to transform into a massive war that would last for years and cost millions of lives. And now, a special motorcycle weather report from Progressive. Well, today you can expect lots of cloud cover with 0% chance of raining on your parade because you'll be riding your motorcycle vroom vroom. That rumbling low-pressure system beneath you should give way to a relaxing commute and a sudden urge to take the scenic route everywhere you go because, dang nabbit, you're having fun out there. That's your forecast. Back to you. This has been a special motorcycle weather report from Progressive, where every day's a beautiful day to ride with coverage from America's number one motorcycle insurer. Get a quote today and see what you could save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. 92% of households that join Peloton early in the year are still active a year later. Yeah, if you like cycling to EDM. Not just EDM. Try cycling to Broadway hits, take a scenic hike in Iceland on our treadmill, or row to some 80s jams. Because I have so much free time. Whether you have 30 minutes or just five, Peloton can fit any schedule. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton tread, row, or bikes risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial.